you is Armin Rigo. He's going to be talking about PyPy. Armin has a list of qualifications that is way too long to talk about. Um, many degrees. Very smart guy. Uh, I look forward to hearing him. Armin, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Can we switch the screen, please? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk about PyPy. Well, what is PyPy to start with? PyPy is an alternative Python interpreter. It comes including a just-in-time compiler, which is basically all I want to say here. <laughs> I mean, here is an example. That's some completely stupid Python code, a one-page example. This is, well, you have the main loop here where you add the number i and then you add the invert of the number i, but, but well, you notice that everything is done with instance of this class number instead of real integers. So. Running this on top of CPython has a huge overhead. You need to create and throw away the instance of the class, etc., etc. This is just a small example, right? So, if I run it, well, first, okay, I can run PyPy. It's exactly like CPython, basically, with one essential difference: is that the prompt that you see here. has four instead of three. <laughs> Greater than science. Well, okay, it's a Python interpreter, right? So I can do stuff. Print hello if one print hello and then correct my mistake on the previous line. Okay. Now, if I want, if I try to run the example I, I showed before, foo, let's run it one billion times, takes a while, done. Okay, so what occurred? This horrible loop actually ran one billion times on my machines which runs about two billion CPU instructions per second and it took about three seconds. So what? It means that this code, this loop, is actually done in about six CPU instructions, which is, well, great, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, you really need to allocate two numbers. So add plus equal allocates one extra number. This allocates one extra number. This allocates one extra number. It it's all reduced to six CPU cycles. Okay, this is, this is the, the most extreme kind of example on which PyPy is great, uh, well, at least greatly faster than CPython. Now, of course, PyPy is actually a um, Python interpreter that is able to run big programs, and, well, the speedups are not completely incredibly good, like this particular example, but still. How fast is PyPy? This is a web page updated nightly containing some number of benchmarks. I mean, it's, it's probably too small to read. It's a re some real life, some uh, number of real life benchmarks. And you can see here, well, that's the speed of CPython 2.7.2. And that's the speed in PyPy. So it's generally faster depends a bit on the benchmark, but you can see here the how has PyPy performance evolved over time. This is PyPy 1.4. Well, this is CPython. This is PyPy 1.4, which was in 2010, and this is now. So it's, I mean, the geometric average on our particular set of benchmarks is 5.68 times faster. 
okay and the, the kind of benchmarks is well this does not include the stupid benchmark I, sh I, sh I showed just before it's really more you have you have a, a Django which builds builds a complete table I mean a large and wide table in the Django preprocessing system and well twisted here uh, spit file spam base real life basically examples you have here okay so this is what Piper is a bit more precisely a uh, bit of history Piper was actually around since 2003 so well it was not production ready since two years ago uh, the release was 1.4 which means it was a lot of work to do but we are basically getting there now um, it, uh, it actually had a lot of funding um, the European Union had it in its framework program 6 gave us gave us money and then the Euro Eurostars program which is another European program and now nowadays we are running on donations from individuals um, yes, the, the, the current status, the numbers that I showed already. Um, well, also, also, there are more PyPy friendly programs than before now, in the sense that, well, the the, the incredible speed I, sh I just showed in my stupid example, well, it was already already that good two years ago. However, in these two years we improved a lot on the overall speed of a Python program r actually doing things with tons of modules and things. So, so n now we, we are, well, we are in the process, I should say, but we alre already have gone some way towards, well, towards avoiding situation where your program is, is 17 times faster here, but twice as slow there. And with a negative uh, mean in the end. Okay, um, we have some. Well, PyPy is being recognized in the sense that y y y you can find it um, in most common distri Linux distributions. Um, there is a Windows 32 bit version and a Mac version. And also, another point is that it is. It is also, Papai is a very different in the process than CPython. It is able to run the C extension modules. C extension modules that are written using the C Python C API. So it's, it's able to, to run them at least in some kind of slow and emulated mode, but it's able to run them. And so we run big parts at least of PyOpen SSL and LXML and, and probably a large number of other other C extension modules. Well, the current organization of PyPy is, is part of the fr Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a US non profit organization. Uh, Bradley, which is who is uh, Software Freedom Conservancy chairman, successfully fights US bureaucracy, so we're happy about it. Um, the, the current model, the current funding model is that um, people or companies can can give us small or large amounts of money. So it's a bit like a Kickstarter style mm, kind of money. And we, are, we have three sub-projects running now. Um, the Pi3K, which whose goal is to port PyPy to Python 3. Um, the NumPy sub-project whose goal is to make a fast implementation of NumPy in, Py, in PyPy and the STM sub-project software transactional memory well, which I will talk a bit more later during this talk so yes, we, we got some some number like, like uh, $100,000 in total which is, which is great I suppose 
-hmm. Well, a quick word about PyPy's just-in-time compiler. Well, it removes abstractions like we have seen with with uh, number classes in my stupid example at the start of the talk. It actually removes the abstraction. Of course, there is no way that in six CPU cycles you can actually allocate five of these instances and then freeze them. There are, there are, the JSON Dam compiler is actually figuring out that they, they are created there and destroyed, well, forgotten there, so, so that it can actually remove the overhead of actually creating it at all. So this, I this is a strong point of our JIT compiler. And, and another point is that our JIT compiler almost never gives up. I mean, if you want, if you want a comparison, for example, uh, TraceMonkey, which, which used to be um, a similar kind of JIT compiler for uh, Firefox by Mozilla, well, th th they kind of gave up on the idea, or, or at least partly gave up, because, well, we, we, we think that their problem was that uh, their JIT, JIT compiler was great as long as you hit paths for which they have the JIT compiler. As soon as you try to do something using JavaScript for which a JIT compiler does not specifically have a path, then it has to fall back to the interpreter. And then, and then well, <laughs> it's costly basically to switch between the JIT compiler and the interpreter. So one difference is that in our case, we the the JIT our JIT compiler. The difference is that it is automatically generated, which means, well, PyPy is written. If you, you well, one detailed quote about how PyPy is written is that PyPy is written completely in Python, and then this Python code, which is actually some some. Python dialect that we call R Python, but but that we can still run as normal Python. Well, this R Python code is translated to C code, so we translate statically the interpreter. This this is the interpreter. So so in particular, our JIT compiler works by analyzing the interpreter itself. So. We have a JIT compiler that that well works with any other language, li like I said here, in the sense that if you come up with an implementation of an interpreter and write it in R Python, then you can use our toolchain, the toolchain in PyPy, to get out of it the translation of the interpreter in C code and a just-in-time compiler for your particular language. So this, this has, well, this has both um, an overhead in terms of, well, of runtime, like for example, the, 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 the warm-up time of our just-in-time compiler is, is huge. I mean, it's, it's really, completely incredible uh, if you compare it with other just-in-time compilers that exist nowadays. Uh, um, I mean, for, 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 the larger, for the largest programs, we actually, well, I mean, we, we have a program that runs for half an hour, for example. On this program, it's a huge and big program, in this program there is about one minute of just making code that will be run by the JIT. But, but, but it still ends up being about 2.5 times faster than CPython. So this, is, this was a very quick overview of our JIT. Uh, yes, it works on, it works on x86, 32, 64-bit, on ARM v7, and soon on Power64 machines. Mm -hmm. So yes, so as, a, as I'm trying to, to explain, we, we are really 
we are really now focusing on, on real world applications instead of small tiny examples and, and we, we are getting we are getting somewhere basically. Real world applications run and they run faster on PyPy, generally speaking. So try it basically. <laughs> it would be my recommendation. Um, uh, um, quick, quick, quickly deep digging into what we are currently working on. On uh, there, I there is a Py 3K proposal with whose goal is to support Python 3. So, so the goal, the goal will be to have a, pi a version of PyPy which itself is a Python 3 interpreter. Well, the it will. I should mention that it will it will only be w well um, we will support python 3 and but also continue to support python 2 because because simply PyPy itself is written in python 2 and 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 well we are self hosting basically and we want to continue to be self hosting so mm -hmm. uh yes this is the current status of the python 3 branch focus on correctness rather than speed right now. Um, first 90% done, remaining 90% not done. <laughs> and it turns out that, uh, well, a lot of people have contributed. However, the for this sub-project, the majority of the fund have been provided by Google, who I should thank. Mm -hmm. um, the second sub project is NumPy, so the, the Python library with, well, handling matrices basically. I extremely used fundamentally in the scientific usage of Python. Um, well, progress is going on slowly. This is, well, multi dimensional ar arrays, broadcasting, fancy indexing, this is all done all D types except uh, string ob objects. I think complexes are done by now. Uh, they ha th well, we, we are getting generally good results for performance, which means, which means at least as fast as C Python, which is already something. But actually, there are use cases where, where we manage to be faster. Even, even for, well, even for you, you have to realize that NumPy is really only about huge matrices, and most of the time actually spent in a typical NumPy program is is writ Fortran or C code that will work over the matrix to do something like addition or multiplication. And we we still manage to be faster, basically, uh, using various tricks. I will not go into the details now. And the, la the last subtopic is software transactional memory. Well, I, 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 will, uh, I will explain it a bit later. The goal is to remove the global interpreter lock. I mean, who knows what the global interpreter lock is in Python? Mm -hmm. So this, this, is, this is one, well, how should I say? Uh, I should say it's it's one 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 s one path towards a global interpreter lockless version of Python, and it actually works because 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 I have a working a working prototype. But but also the the important point is that it actually opens the door to new models. I mean you will be able to use to 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 not actually have to use threads to run a process on multiple cores which which just sounds strange right <laughs> okay and th the last thing i want to talk about is calling c How do you call C code from Python code in general? Well, there is no single answer. 
you can write a C Python C extension, but you can also use wrapper generators like Swig. Or you can use something a bit strange like C types, in which you write pure Python code in which you describe what C code you want to call. Or there is also Cypher, which is kind of great. Well, we decided that none of these was convenient, so we made another one, <laughs> which we call CFFI, because, well, foreign function interface for C. Uh, here is an example. I mean, you the, the strange bit, which comes from Luajit, actually, it's a great idea. Uh, well, I think it's a great idea, but it took me a while to understand why it's a great idea, is that you you well you call cffi.cdef this is all python code right except this thing it's a big string that contains c function declarations so just by having this it's enough for the printf call here to work in the sense to really be able to to call thi this c function <laughs> Yes, it, it just looks crazy, but, but it's actually very convenient. <laughs> and this line here is the very same thing than the C line, well, s where, where you would declare a variable of type char bracket, give it the name arg, and initialize it with the string word. It's very much the same line because in C, in this in this case, you can also omit the length. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, the general idea is that in CFFI, well, you you want to call C code, well, th th then you have to write C. Okay, <laughs> it is kind of obvious. I mean. Compare it with C types, for example. If you know C types, you can do mostly the same thing, except that it's much bigger because every time, well, you, you cannot declare this function printf as one line. You have to declare it as Python code. Declare there is function printf, oh, it will make an argument that is of type C types dot C underscore char underscore P, I think. And as a dot dot dot, I don't even remember how you do it in C in C types and so on and so forth. Well, here th the point is that really you write in your code CFI C def triple quote, then you paste things from the man page, and then you close the triple quote and it works. <laughs> well, okay, Th this was this was a kind of side to pick. I mean, in the sense that this this CFI module is actually available on both C Python and PyPy, and well, uh, performance-wise, maybe a side note. Performance-wise, on top of CPython, it's a bit slowish. I mean, it's it's on the same kind of performance than C types. However, on PyPy, on PyPy, if you have here a call, and and I don't know, put it in a loop and something, so that it has time, so the JSON compiler has enough time to warm up, then you end up with the generated code, the generated assembler produced by our JIT will directly contain the call to the actual C function. Well, y you, you can't possibly be any faster, basically. <laughs> and yes, uh, well, here is the kind of thing you can do. Well, basically we are we're pushing it forward because because we 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 found out that it's it's a great way to it's a great way to do it to do calling C functions in the context of PyPy. It also works fine on C Python, but in the context of PyPy, the, the problem is that all the other points, all the other ways, C extension and C siphon and so on, they all have a lot of issues. They are too much too much too deeply. In interconnected with C Python. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here I have a nice slide about software transactional memory. So
So now I, w I want to give a, to give you an, an overview about well something you should know how the global interpreter loop works. If you define a function. Uh, Here is a function that will pop an item from one list and append it into another list. Okay? Now you imagine that this code is actually run as part of a bigger program that is a multi threaded program. And the list one and list two are also visible from other threads. And maybe other threads will also modify the same list. Okay? So here, what, what we want and what this code really does is it removes the last item from list one and put it into list two. Okay? Sounds obvious. So, in particular, if, for example, you have another place running in another thread that returns the sum of the length of the two lists, it should be intuitively obvious that this should, well, like if you have 10 items here and 0 here, this should return 10. But it will not actually always return 10, of course, as you know. Because, because here it can run up to here and get the answer 10 from this. And then it runs this. So then it finishes running that and it sees the x here. So this will be 1. So it will return 11. But that of course at no point in time are there 11 elements in total in my two lists. So this is, an this is an I mean, vi vi this is of course completely obvious basically to anyone that needs to deal with multiple threads. And, and of course the, 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 the issues are actually the same or, the, the well, it's already, it is already simpler in Python than it would be in Java or in C. Because if you're trying to do the same thing in Java or in C, you're likely to get completely sick faults or, or random memory corruption and, well, crash, basically. So w why don't you get crashes in Python? Well, because the language design pushed forward by Guido is to say you should not get crashes in Python. So how did they, they fix it? They, they added a global interpreter lock, which means that in practice only one thread can advance the computation. So, so basically, for example, this list.pop will be run atomically. We know that this will both return x and remove it from the list and it will do it all atomically in the sense that it's not possible it's not actually possible that this code would get a strong result because this has already half run for example okay well what what if you actually had a way to write in Python with Atomic? And this, this would be just s asking, oh, and please, I want to run these two lines, but I don't want anybody else to actually run in parallel. So, I mean, this is actually very easy to implement in C Python, for example. This just this just means run the content of the with block without releasing the global interpreter lock. You keep it. Okay. Well, here you would need to write it here too. And now your program really behaves as you would expect. Now this atomic thing can be implemented in C Python and well why hasn't it been done already? Because because so far, I mean, li li like in the in the last decade or so, it was thought to be to be the wrong the wrong 
approach, the wrong point of view. There is no way, for example, you can implement it on s JSON, on on R, on Python, on on these other Python implementation. That's uh, because they themselves, well, themselves they use uh, their own native native uh, virtual machines uh, abstractions for threads, and these these abstractions don't include things like atomic. So you you cannot implement it. So this this was pushed forward as one of the reasons, but well, wha what I'm what I'm trying to push forward now is that I it's actually a very bad idea, and this atomic is the future basically, quote, because okay. Now you have written your program like this, and it's safe, okay. But then, let's say I want to do some. Well, I have I have a big dict containing stuff, and for every key of the dictionary, I want to compute something. Then, then, well, for for key in the dictionary, compute the thing. Okay. Now, if if I tried to to run the various computations in different threads. I would not gain anything, right, because of the global interpreter log. But let's ignore that. Let's and really r spawn different threads. So you you can you can actually imagine some kind of some kind of API that is that is a bit hiding the fact that it's r using raw threads, L like you can say. Um, here I want to do things with my key. So this just register all the thing you want to do and then well then uh, transaction run which will actually pop pop the items from this list one after the other and run them in a thread pool for example y you can imagine this kind of thing okay of course of course here we are, we are actually writing a python so well the the the, the issue the, the issue is if to if if there are conflicts between the various things you need to do like like for for handling key 1 a particular key on key 2 you have to update this global cache for example so then you need to be to st you need to start being very careful about the update to the global cache i don't know maybe add locks Carefully, a bit everywhere, etc. Well, okay. Or there is the alternative. What if transaction dot run is actually implemented by saying with atomic do do the thing, do the step. Then you then you get the the completely strange because useless model that you would be running several threads. But actually, only one of them can proceed the next item, and all the other ones are waiting. Okay, so what did we gain? Well, what we gained is that actually there, i there is a way to implement this atomic differently, more efficiently. There is a way to have with atomic allow two different atomic blocks in two different threads to run in parallel but then well then it's called transactional memory and well I it's 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 basically, basically it's, it's involved but only in terms of the implementation in terms of the implementation it's involved because well what 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 do you need to do you need to start both threads in parallel but carefully detect when when one for example would actually create a situation that conflicts with the other one so y you need to detect this kind of conflicts automatically and when they occur well you need to pause one of the two threads or, or even roll back which means cancel what it has done and, and then retry again well, this is called—I mean, this is called transactional memory. 
because it's very similar to the concept of transaction found in databases where, where well, you start your transaction, you try to do things. Um, well, while you are running your transaction, you see a consistent view of the database, meaning you, you don't see the other updates occurring in parallel. And then at the end, you try to commit, and either it works, or, or you have conflict somewhere and then it fails and, and then you typically loop over and try again the operation you just did. So the trying again in, in the case of PyPy here is hidden under the carpet, but apart from that it's, it's mostly the same idea. So what, what do you get? you get? You get a model in which you can actually run multiple tra multiple threads that each have big transactions like with atomic and maybe not a one line of code but things that actually do things i mean y you can really imagine that instead of this simple line you have you have things that really takes 0 0.1 second to run or something like that but you can run you, you can really have a model in which you have multiple threads and all these atomic blocks will appear to you as a programmer as if they were ordered in some way. I mean, like, like a normal transaction in a database, right? They, they appear to be ordered, but they have actually run in parallel on multiple cores or, or on multiple machines. Yeah, uh, if we are talking about database, <laughs> so this is <laughs> this is basically the model that I'm I'm working now right now on on PyPy and on on uh, well, it it works already. Um, hmm? ah, sorry. <laughs> no. Sorry. Bigger. Yes, this is a, this is a version of PyPy which does not have a JIT included. However, it has um, uh, atomic built-in, and in this version of PyPy, you can really run examples. I mean, I have an example running one of our own benchmarks, and you can really run it on multiple threads, and it it well it speeds up things basically. Well, yes. R right now, it's a bit of of the kind you you have to believe me, because <laughs> <laughs> because yes, it speeds up things, but then it has a constant two or three times slower overhead, which means that on this machine, which has really only two different cores, then well, y you don't see any speed up, of course. Ho however, well, I mean, the, 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 the real goal of the project is is it's not i mean if you are called if your company is called google and you have you have an issue like 10000 servers running your program is uh, uh, and you have a performance issue there s then you, you well yeah, then you have a performance issue and then you need to have clever people looking into the to the program how to optimize it okay that's not what i'm talking about here what i'm talking about here is a situation where you write a program and and well, it's it, it can be a throwaway program, whatever, s a small server, anything, and you have a performance problem in the sense that well, it's really getting too slow running it on this on one CPU of this server, but but uh, it's stupid because I know that this server has 24 cores or something like that. Well then. This is basically the kind of, of target I'm, I'm talking about. 
this is the kind of target that ca can really g get sped up by, by these techniques. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. I can see one already. Let me get you the mic because we are recording it, so your question will be on the recording. Hi. Um, I was just wondering with your STM, does it use a similar model to a similar pattern to what you were showing with the width atomic, or does it try to figure out what co what block should be atomic by itself? No, no. It is using the same model. Uh, the same I model. mean, I mean, the, the so you mark atomic blocks. Yes. Okay. How it works is that you have two kinds of atomic blocks. Yeah. You have the implicit blocks that are basically running from one point where you would release the gel until the next point where you would release the gel. And here, instead of a gel, you mark everything in between as one transaction. Okay, cool. uh, and then you have the with atomic block, which allows you to get larger transactions. More questions? Okay. I mean, you say there's an interaction with uh, other languages when, uh, uh, just at the bottom of one of the slides. Um, is R Python generic enough to be able to implement other languages with it besides Python? Uh, yes, yes. R Python is a very generic language. Well, it's really targeted towards implementing other languages, but it has been used for at least demo versions of um, JavaScript Prolog. There is sm some squeak, uh, some uh, um, scheme, some scheme interpreter, and then nowadays we are working on PHP and Ruby. Okay. <laughs> well, some some of us are. Not good me. Good luck with that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, how does this uh, tie into LLVM? <laughs> Yes, well, LLVM, LLVM, arg. LL LLVM is a great project that we tried to use about four or five times. <laughs> I mean, how does it tie to it? Well, I one thing is that LLVM is really at the level of the C compiler, right? What you really need here is a language like RPython, which is at the higher level. I mean, RPython is still completely garbage collected for example. We have an implementation of Python that really uses lists and dictionaries in the implementation. And we don't care about free memory like all the py increfs and py decrefs that you see in the source code of CPython. We don't have any of that. So, so it's really a, a higher Ca level. Can you implement R Python with LLVM? Y yes. Because then you'd have a tool chain all the way down. Yes, yes. Um, the, uh, our standard way to implement R Python is to generate C code and then throw it into GCC. However, we ha also have at least an experimental way to generate LLVM bytecode and send it through LLVM. But the, well, that's a bit what the point. You can also generate C code and then compile it with Clang, with Clang, yeah, and it works. And it works great. My, my question is, in the software transactional memory, is it, a, is it a goal to kind of emulate, I, I want to say, the semantics of a global interpreter lock? Uh, yes, so the goal is to preserve semantics completely, wi wi which also has other advantages, like, like, like you have all your existing multi-threaded Python code, well, that will still run fine. Hi. Um, you mentioned that ARM is a supported platform. What yes. is the performance difference, perhaps, between ARM and x86 at the moment look like? I don't know exactly. Uh, well, ARM is a supported platform in the sense that we have a JIT backend able to produce directly ARM instructions in memory. Uh, I mean, this JIT backend w was done on it's actually r relatively good, probably did not see as many of the tiny optimizations that we put in the x86 backend, but uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's good, basically. It's not great, but good, I would say. Mm -hmm. 
Hi. Um, awesome project. For a lot of us who, who, who know Python, are comfortable with Python, but not quite level at the like Python level that you guys are operating at, how can we get involved <laughs> in, in PyPy, and, and what can we do? Um, yes. I, I, don't, I fully understand that not everyone needs to be able to write a JIT. Uh, in order to get involved in an open source project? Yes. What are sort of entrance well, level things that people can get involved in? Well, yes, PyPy is also a large collection of very different things. And you can uh, actually get involved in one corner of PyPy and not, not knowing at all anything about the rest. I mean, we, we have somebody that actually contributed very good optimizations of the just-in-time compiler. And he knows only the optimizer of the just-in-time compiler, right? He, he does not know anything about Python semantics, let's say. So, so, uh, and then reversely, reversely, we have people that contribute on NumPy, for example. So the problem is to write an implementation of NumPy in R Python. Well, they are doing so and not caring about the JIT, but getting the JIT for free, basically, for them. And and and, and yes, they are, they are they are just a lot of levels, like 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 somebody. Somebody, somebody really came and used R Python in order to implement its own, its own completely, completely uh, uh, experimental dynamic language, for example. And he was completely happy because, because well, the speed is good, good enough. I mean, we have a garbage collector that is good enough. We have a JIT, and and you get all this for free. Cool. Thank you very much, Armin. Unfortunately, we have to move on. Um, but thank you again. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs>